Amen. Would you give a high praise to the Lord real quick? Come on, would you lift your hands to Jesus? Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much to everybody that made this um, weekend a success. And I want to stay while you're standing. Big thank you to Pastor and Sister Boyd for facilitating this conference. Would you give them a hand? They are awesome people. And um, we love them very much. We love their family. Awesome, awesome people. To all the leadership and staff that made this possible, thank you. You are high caliber. And, um, of course, Sister Jerry Joe and all the music team and music staff, you've done a phenomenal job. And there are great things in store for this church and this area. And while you're standing, I want to give honor to Pastor Plowman today. God bless you, sir. Love this man very much. He's an awesome man of God. And it's an honor to have him here. Also have his church here. Thank you for making the journey tonight. Every other minister that would be here and their family, thank you. And, of course, lastly, to all of you for being here tonight. You have so many other places you could be, but you should be where you are tonight. Amen. As we see commitment levels dropping worldwide in church attendance, we need to be more committed in this last day to the apostolic church. <clears throat> A couple of nights ago I talked about breakthrough condemnation. This morning I talked about breaking through fear. Tonight I'm going to talk about breakthrough to your anointing. Breakthrough to your anointing. If you have your Bibles, I want to turn your attention to Exodus chapter 30 and also 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13. We're going to go to 1 Samuel first. Thank you so much for your participation in worship. It's amazing that we, when we begin to worship together, it's awesome. How many of you live in a house? Would you raise your hand? Okay. How many of you live in an apartment? Would you raise your hand? Okay. And, 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 and I live in a fifth wheel. Um, but you know what's, what's, what's crazy is the God we serve doesn't live in a house. And the God we serve does not live in an apartment. You know what the Bible says? He inhabits the praises of his people. When you begin to praise and worship God, he desires to live in the midst of that. <laughs> and this is just a small taste of what heaven will be like. Sound guys, thank you so much. You've been incredible this whole week. Media guys, thank you so much. You've been incredible this whole week. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask of you just a little bit more monitor if I can. My voice is starting to go. It's... It's been a weekend, and uh, I told somebody one time, man, I wish they'd start making, I think there's a market, ladies, you might not understand this, but I think for guys, there's a market for, for apostolic dress socks. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean every dress sock I put on, by the end of worship service, it keeps sliding down. Y'all know what I'm talking about, man? Y'all got to go down there and pull those bad boys back up. Uh, so we need a, a maker for some apostolic, thank you, that sounds amazing, apostolic dress socks. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, I'm so glad everybody's here. This is going to be, I, I prayed this afternoon, and of course during pre-service prayer I prayed for there to be an impartation. Now a lot of preachers will say there's going to be an impartation, and there is. Sometimes they're speaking from their own faith that there's going to be an impartation to the people. I'm letting you know today I have nothing of value I myself can impart to you. But I prayed that God would impart something to us today. And that is a new and fresh anointing. And we got a breakthrough. Because let me just, just say before I get into this message, we need God's anointing in this last day. We don't need it, we, look, what, no matter what side of the line you stand on, we, we, a politician will never make a difference in this world that's eternal. 
The difference that everybody's looking for will not come through a politician. Never. You say, Brother Vaughn, how can you say that? Because it's not in the book. That's how I can say that. The only positive eternal change that will ever come to this world has to come through the anointed apostolic church. You are the hope that this world has. That is why it is of the utmost importance that we seek his anointing. 1 Samuel 16, 13. The prophet Samuel, you all know the story, has been called by God to go to the house of Jesse and anoint the next king of Israel. Verse 13 says, then Samuel took the horn of oil. Would you say horn of oil? Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that being David, in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Then if you want to flip back to Exodus chapter 30. This is, if you don't know, Exodus chapter 30 is, how many of you like to cook? Okay, how many of you like to eat? <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> I think I just hit something in the Holy Ghost tonight, you know. Uh, this is the original recipe. This is the, not for Colonel Sanders, okay. This is the original recipe for the anointing oil of God. Serious business. Watch this. The Bible says, moreover, the Lord spake to Moses. This is, again, verse 22 of, of chapter 30. God spake to Moses, saying, take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, of sweet cinnamon, half so much, 250 shekels, of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels. After the shekel of the sanctuary... And this is confusing in the King James, and it says, and of oil, olive, a hen. In other words, he says, and a hen of olive oil. So you have four principal spices unified by one hen of oil, which in our measurement system is about a gallon. One gallon of olive oil. And look what it says in closing. It says, and you shall make it a oil of holy ointment. An ointment compound after the art of the apocryphy. You know what that is? That's the after the art of the perfumer. In other words, the anointing ought to give off a certain aroma. It ought to be evident that an individual is covered in the anointing of God. And it shall be a holy anointing oil. Again, I want to talk to you this afternoon, this evening, from this topic. Breaking through to your anointing. Breaking through to your anointing. Would you one more time lift your hands? And I want you to open your hearts and your minds in prayer right now. Would you, would you just intercede tonight for a few moments? I know you've been worshiping your socks off, but I, I, I'm wondering if it was just a couple interceders in the house today. Jesus, you said that there would be an impartation tonight. You said that there would be miracles and signs and wonders that would manifest themselves tonight. That somebody would receive a miracle in their body tonight. God, I pray that you would let a mighty impartation of the Holy Ghost fall upon your people. That you would anoint them from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. For the mission that you have put before this church and the county and these people. God, let us be a light that is in this world of darkness. Let us arise as a city that sit on a hill that cannot be hid. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Blessed be your name, God. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. I know God's going to do something in the house. God's going to do something in your life if you open your heart to receive it tonight. I remember a long time ago in my youth, I was on my way. I went to a, a camp meeting, and it was a youth camp, and I can remember there just being a powerful move of the Spirit of God. I don't remember exactly what was preached. I don't remember the songs that were sang. But I remember finding myself in the altar with all kinds of other young people, and one by one, as time went on, individuals began to trickle out of that service. 
and, and time seemed to pass away from me as I was in that altar. Have you ever had a moment like that in the presence of God? I was, I was so hungry to receive something from God, and I didn't even know what it was. The only way I could describe it is, you remember the story of Jacob? You remember the Bible says that Jacob wrestled with an angel? He had reached such a low point in his life that when that angel came by in desperation, he reached out to that angel and said, I'm not letting you go. The angel said, let me go. He said, I'm not letting you go. I'm at such a low point, I need something from God right now, and I'm not giving up until I get it. It was that pure determination of Jacob that got him that blessing. And I was having that kind of moment in that altar. Only now do I realize that I was hungry for a calling of God. Only now do I realize I was hungry for the anointing of God. And let me tell you something. Only now do I realize that many share this hunger for this obscure, incomprehensible touch of God we call the anointing. I want to tell you that many musicians and singers long for this anointing. And some acquire it. Many preachers and teachers long for the anointing of God, and some of them get it. And I just want to be honest with you tonight, because not everybody has God's anointing upon their life. See, because of its exorbitant cost, many choose to operate without it. Relying on pure talent and natural ability. They become the fulfillment of the infallible word of God written to the Corinthian church, sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Sometimes we try to add to it or try to imitate it with lights or impeccable musical performances. We recognize its importance. We talk about it in our spiritual circles, but we must realize in this last hour, in this late hour of time, that there is not a sufficient substitute for the pure, undefiled anointing of God. You ought to desire it. You ought to seek for it. You ought to long for it. Don't ever think you can take it for granted because not everybody attains the anointing of God. Many operate out of pure talent and pure ability. I study communication all the time. Because it's my job to be a communicator. But if all I am is a good communicator, if all I can do is craft and deliver a good speech, then that's all I am. Without God's anointing, I'm just a gifted speaker. And like I said before, I can move your emotion. Beyonce could come up, I said before, in the music conference and sing a song, and she will move your emotion. But no eternal change will ever come to your life because there's no anointing. So beyond speaking ability, beyond singing ability, you better hunger and long for God's anointing. It's the only thing that makes a difference. The only thing that makes a difference is God's anointing. We need to long for it. We need to desire it. And can I just say real quick that every generation, must experience God's anointing for themselves. Young people, I'm talking to you tonight, but I'm talking about every generation here. Every generation needs to experience God's anointing for yourself. Let me show you something. Judges 2 and 8 says, And Joshua, this is the leader, the son of Nun died, being 110 years old. Verse 10 says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor the works that he had done in Israel. What a travesty. And yet, we are alive in a time right now where generations that are coming up, your generation and some of my generation, do not know God or the works that he's done. I, I, I don't know if you know this or not, 
I was out to a, let me just share with you. I was out to a restaurant one time. I didn't know it. I was out to a restaurant one time with a pastor. This is just a, a couple months ago. He said, we're talking to this waitress. We want her to come to church. She came to the table, and he said, you know, we've been talking to you for a while. We, we'd like to extend you an invitation to the church. And she said, man, I would love to come to church. She said, do you know I've never been to church? And, and, and the pastor said, I mean, not even for a funeral, not even for a, a wedding, nothing. You've never been to church? She said, I've never been to church. He said, have you ever heard of Noah in the ark? She said, what's that? These are things that we take for granted. But I'm telling you right now, you live and are surrounded by generations right now that do not know God or the works that he has done. Every generation, you must experience God's touch for yourself. Let me, let me just say real quick, your mom's anointing will not do for you. Your dad's anointing will not do it for you. Even your pastor's anointing will not do it for you. You must get a hold of God's anointing for yourself. You will not ride on the coattails of your pastor's anointing. You won't ride on the coattails of your mom's anointing, of your dad's anointing. You must get it for yourself. There's got to be a desire in the generations coming up. It's a godless generation. There's a movie that just came out that was, I don't know if it was last year released. How many of y'all heard that movie, God's Not Dead? How many of y'all seen that movie? You either heard it, you've seen about it. I was preaching a revival in Atlanta, and my friend says, hey, we're going to start a campus ministry. He said, would you like to come and speak at this campus? I said, man, I would love that. I love speaking to college and career and to young people. I'm like, yeah, that is right up my alley. Let's do it. He didn't tell me the whole story. And so we're on our way in the car. And I said, by the way, what campus are we going to? He said, we're trying to start to launch a, a campus ministry, CMI, at Emory University. And I said, oh, okay. He said, you don't know about Emory University, do you? I said, no. He said, Emory University is the university where the events, God's not dead, those events took place. And I thought, oh, no. And I started to think for a moment, guys, I started to think for a moment, maybe I should adjust what I felt to speak on. Because I didn't know if there was going to be some kind of professor that's like a genius that comes in there and wants to debate evolution with me or some kind of, you know, I just didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I started to feel insecure. And I started to feel nervous. And, and, and you know what, I'm, I, I've told you this before, I'm not, I don't. I don't claim to be some kind of super spiritual oogie boogie, you know, everything is a spiritual. But let me, let me tell you, I, I just, I, I felt myself wanting to change who I was in that moment. And I thought, you know what, I'm not going to do that. We got out of the car, we walked across the parking lot, we crossed the street at Emory University, and as soon as my foot made that step on the campus, I said within myself, I said, I come on this campus. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I walked on that campus. because Hey, because you know what Paul says? We're ambassadors. That is such a cool thing. Ambassadors, our ambassadors go with the power of the President of the United States. Did you know that? When they go to foreign soil, they represent the power of their sovereign. They have that power. And Paul says, hey, you're an ambassador. You know what that says to me? Okay, let me, just, let me just step on a soapbox real quick, and I'm going to get right off it. Our problem is we have become permanently established in this earth. We have taken up a home mentality in this earth. We used to sing songs that said, this world isn't my home, I'm just passing through, right? My treasure's laid up somewhere. Y'all don't know anything about that. My treasure's laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckoning me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. 
We don't sing songs like that anymore. You know why? Because we've established some kind of residency mentality in this earth. We become consumed about our own priorities and our own responsibilities in our own life, in our own free time, in our own finances. Yeah, now it's cricket, cricket. But that's exactly what's happened. Paul said, you're an ambassador. You know what that says? Young guys, young ladies, you are not of this world. If, you're, if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus and you've been filled with his spirit, you are not of this world. You represent another place. You represent a heavenly place. And you are just here as an ambassador representing the power of your sovereign. That's why we're supposed to be Christ to this world. It wasn't Brandon Ball walking on that campus. It was in the name of Jesus Christ I come on this campus as an ambassador. We went down a hallway. We went downstairs. We went in this little classroom where a handful of students gathered. I said, I'm not changing my message one iota. I don't care who walks in the room. I'll just depend on him to do the rest of the work. And I begin to preach and I begin to talk. And it was about 30 minutes later that the Holy Ghost fell in that little room at Emory University. And students begin to speak in other tongues filled with the Holy Ghost. God's not dead. He is very much alive. You must experience the anointing of God for yourself. Every generation needs the touch of God. Come on, I want you to worship the Lord for just a few more moments. Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. Your hands ought to be up. I'm not going to care what my friends think. I'm not going to care what my family thinks. I need God's anointing for my life. It might not be Emory University that depends on you, but this city depends on you, and this county depends on you, and the state of Wisconsin depends on you. Come on, young man. I, talk, I come to tell you that God's got a calling on some of your lives. Come on, young lady. God's got a calling on your life. Don't ever limit yourself. God's got great plans in store for you. Come on, if you want the anointing of God in your life, I want you to clap your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm moving along. Every generation must experience the anointing. And not only every generation, but the church must be anointed. The church must be anointed. We can use our time praying for the different ministries that go out from the church. Outreach, music, youth, the various other ministries that go out, that reach out. But if the church is saturated with the anointing, then understand if the church itself is saturated in the anointing, then everything that flows out of it will be in turn already anointed. Anointing is not a byproduct of the church, but all of the church's byproducts had better be anointed. It's not a byproduct. In the Old Testament, we get a great example when the tabernacle was anointed. It wasn't just the tabernacle, but it was the ark of testimony, the table of showbread. It was the golden candlestick. It was the altar of incense. It was the altar of burnt offerings. It was the laver of water. And all the other vessels pertaining to the tabernacle were saturated in the anointing. It wasn't just those, art those articles, but patriarchs were anointed. Priests were anointed. Lepers in their cleansing ceremony were anointed. And kings and priests alike were all anointed. So you don't pray for God to anoint your singing. Don't pray for God to anoint your preaching. Pray for God to anoint you. 
Because if you are anointed, everything and extension that comes out of you will have God's touch upon it. Anointing is the only thing that makes a difference. Anointing is the only thing that can break the yoke of bondage. Not a good speech. Not a powerful song. Anointing is the single element that can break the shackles of sin and bondage. Anointing is the thing we need to long for, not take for granted. We need to long for and desire it and attain the anointing of God. But there's a cost. Anointing's not free, there's a cost. Here's what I'll say for the cost. Anointing and the Spirit of God were always tight in the Bible by oil. So I will explain to you the cost by making this statement. If there is no blood, there can be, there cannot be any oil. No blood, no oil. What is the cost of the anointing? 1 Samuel 16, 13 says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brethren. And that, from that point, the Spirit of God came upon him. You see, humanity has always desired. If I asked you, how many of you want to be anointed? Would you raise your hand real quick? I want you to look around at all the hands. I'm unorthodox that way. Most preachers say don't look around, but I like to, I like to say look around. Tilt the hands, okay? Humanity desires, has always desired, this touch of God called the anointing. Kings and priests have desired the touch of God. Let me say it another way. They've desired, listen to this, the content within the horn. (laughs) The prophet came with the horn of anointing oil, which was God's ordained container and method to transport that oil. He was obeying God. He came with the horn of oil. Everybody desired what was inside that. Think about this. Kings desired what was inside of the container. Why? Because it represented God's anointing coming upon their reign. They desired what was inside of it. Lepers. Did you know lepers were anointed with oil? During their cleansing ceremony, could you imagine, you, know, you all know about leprosy? You do? Leprosy was such a horrible, horrible disease that caused you to have to be segregated from your family, from society, from everybody, into a colony of lepers. And at the rare opportunity that you were healed, you had to go before the priest. And there was all kinds of ritual things that happened. One of them was the oil had to be applied to you. So even the leper desired the content within the container. Prophets, prophets desired what was inside of here. I'm playing with you. Prophets desired what was in it. You know why? Because it was God's touch coming upon their ministry. Kings, prophets, check this out. Even the ungodly desired the touch of God. You remember Simon the sorcerer? We talk about it all the time. Woo! God, we want your anointing. Everybody wants the content within the container. You've even openly admitted, yes, I want the anointing. I want the content within the container. We all express that. We all talk about it. We all think about it. Some of us might even pray about it. Everybody wants what's inside of the container. But everybody forgets about the container itself. Give me the oil. What about the horn? What about the container? You see, you can't have the oil without the container. The application is this. You can't have the anointing of God until you have the container. What was the horn? The horn came from an animal. The horn came from a sacrifice. The horn came from a blood sacrifice. 
you couldn't have a container for the oil to begin with until you had a blood sacrifice that preceded it. Everybody wants, oh God, I want a ministry. Oh God, I want to be anointed. Oh God, I want this. I want that. I want the anointing. And we focus so much on what's inside, we forget to be the container. You cannot have the anointing of God until you're willing to live out a life of sacrifice. See, not too many people get that. Not too many people want to talk about that. Oh, we, 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 we want God's anointing. Oh, we, we, want, we want God's touch. And as soon as we start talking about any kind of sacrifice in our life, whoop, there we go. Y'all remember Roadrunner? Pshoo. That's most of us. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, God. You want to encroach upon my free time? I'm sorry, God. You want to pro- encroach upon my finances? This is my last night, y'all, so I'm, I'm just going to bring the, everything I got. I'm sorry, God. You want to encroach upon my friends? I'm sorry, God. You want to encroach upon the music I listen to? You want to encroach upon my schedule, my calendar, my responsibilities? I'm sorry, God, you want to encroach upon my family time? Commitment levels have dropped to such an all-time low. Everybody's got a reason why they don't go to church. And I'll say it so he don't have to. They're all garbage. Guys, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you can't, I'm not saying, you know, you, you take your vacation time. You have time with your family. I'm not being, I'm not being, but, but, but we, we've come up, come, y'all know what I'm talking about. We've come up with so many lame excuses and reasons why we don't go to church. Let's be real with it. You don't want to sacrifice? You can choose to operate without God's anointing. It was a blood sacrifice that preceded the anointing. No blood, no oil. Christ fulfilled this very principle. You wonder why he came to this earth, lived 33 and a half years or whatever it was, healed all kinds of people, raised people from the dead, done nothing but nice things for people, and they crucified him for it. He knew exactly what he was doing. Because without a blood sacrifice, (laughs) there could be no outpouring of the oil in Acts. The sacrifice always precedes the great outpouring of oil. Christ fulfilled this principle. And we're called to walk just as Jesus. Is it any wonder why Paul wrote in Romans, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Pure, holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable service. You're not doing God any favors. It's your reasonable service. Because of the great price that he paid when none of us deserved it. No blood. No oil. The anointing is so complex. Let me go quickly to my Exodus text. The Bible says the original recipe was made of principal spices. Is that what it said? We covered that earlier. Four principal spices unified... By the oil. Watch this. Oh, no, no, go backwards. There we go. Pure myrrh, 500 shekels. Okay? Just do the math. Then we got uh, pure myrrh, 500 shekels. Sweet cinnamon, half as much, 250 shekels. Sweet calamus, so you got two sweets, 250 shekels. Next verse. And cassia, 500 shekels. Four spices. 
too sweet, too bitter, unified by one pin of oil. First, it looks like you just have too sweet, too bitter. But when you do the math, you find out that the bitter ingredients outweigh the sweet ingredients. There you go, mathematician, by twice as much. Why, why is it that we think this walk with God is all supposed to be about sweet ingredients? Why is it as soon as a hardship comes our way, we find every reason in the book to forsake God? Let me, let me just say something. God didn't do anything to you. You live in a sinful world, a fallen world. God has given man free will, and so man by nature is a mess, and it's evil, and so the world it lives in is corrupt. God didn't do anything to you. But while we're ambassadors in this world, there will be both sweet experiences and bitter experiences. The anointing that you say, whew, yes, I want it. I believe you. But you know what God said? You cannot alter. You cannot alter the ingredients. He said you can't imitate it. You can't change it. It is what I've made it to be. The bitter, unfortunately, outweighs the sweet. But for those of us that are truly not concerned with our affairs in this world or this world, and would say, God, whatever it is you want to do with me, I just want your anointing. I just want your touch. No matter what it is, I, I just want to be used by you. What God does through you far outweighs the bitter experiences that you'll get because of the anointing. Many people will run. That, that, that's the divider. Every, oh, oh, every 100% participation. Everybody's hand goes, I want the anointing until you find out that the bitter outweighs the sweet. The sacrifice is great. Skillful singing can't replace it. Skillful speaking can't replace it. Either you want it or you don't. Let me close by, by, by showing something to you here. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 32, take you to the gospel of Mark chapter 14 and verse 32, the Bible says, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said unto his disciples, sit here while I go pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and very heavy. Those words in the English aren't quite a good translation. You look it up for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. But when you look up amazed, where it says, he began to be sore amazed and very heavy. Amazed would better translate something close to fearful. And heavy would translate something close to depressed. Jesus, somewhat afraid of the future and depressed in a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane in the Greek means oil press. The oil press was located at the foot of the Mount of Olives. They would go up into the Mount of Olives by the plowman and they would harvest a big harvest of olives. Y'all ever order a Greek salad? You know the little red ones that come on there? Kalamata olives, they call them. That's good stuff. <laughs> okay, am I preaching or the olives? Both. <laughs> yes. Hey, they go out there and they harvest those olives and they bring them down to Gethsemane in the oil press. And they put them in that big old concrete, y'all know what I'm talking, big old concrete circle. And they got a, a millstone and a little animal that goes around in a circle. And they begin to press those. 
and mash them down. And what you have after that happens is a pulp. And they take this pulp and they begin to stack it between the discs. There's these big circular like discs like, like, like made out of basket material. And they'd put one on the ground. Watch this. Then they'd put some pulp on it. They'd put another one on top of that. They'd put some pulp on it. They'd put another one on top of that. They'd put some, and they stack them up like a hamburger until it gets about five or six feet tall. And then they apply weight. And there's a pressing. And what runs out is pure olive oil. Can you pull up my picture for me real quick? That's what it looks like. I seen that picture, and I said, that's not olive oil. Olive oil is gold. But not in that region, not the region, not the, those, not the olives that are native to that area that they would harvest. This, when they would put that particular harvest of olives under that press, it came out blood red. You might call it a coincidence, but I don't, that Christ, hours before, he would face one of the greatest atrocities was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, the Bible says, right? And he was praying so fervently, and the Bible says he was amazed, he was somewhat fearful, and he was depressed. Why? Because he was God, and he could see into the future, and just in a matter of hours, he's seen the man that would pull his beard out of his face. He's seen the men that would spit on him, slap him, hit him. He's seen the nails. He's seen the hammer. He's seen the whip, the cat of nine tails that would open the flesh of his back. He's seen all of this. No wonder he was amazed. Under so, why was he heavy? He was heavy because of the sins of all humanity, the weight that was pushing down upon him. Your sin, my sin, Pressing upon the totality of Christ was pressed at Gethsemane. Even the Bible says he prayed so hard, Pastor Plowman, that blood began to ooze from his pores. There was such a pressing. But what Christ understood is that I have to, even he prayed. You know what he prayed? He said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will. Christ understood there had to be such a pressing. There had to be the shedding of blood before there could be a great outpouring of his spirit on the day of Pentecost. And he said, I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to be pressed at Gethsemane so there could be a great outpouring of oil. And we have a hard time accepting that. L let, me, let me show you what I mean real quick. Let me show you what I mean. I'm, I'm talking to the young folks because I, I, I believe so much in these young people. <laughs> Y'all need to hear me too, though. His disciples didn't understand. His followers didn't understand this. You know why? Because he, he, he was supposed to be their conquering king. Oh, God, when are you, Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom? He was their superhero, guys. And yet, he come riding in. You think he rode in like a king on a big old stallion? He come riding in on a donkey. And they didn't understand it. They wanted him to restore the kingdom and release him from oppression. And he said, not right now. You don't understand. My kingdom's not of this world. And they didn't understand it. And then to see their superhero led away in chains and ropes, beaten, tortured, crucified, killed, and put in a tomb, they didn't understand that either. They didn't want to partake in that. They wanted their conquering king. Listen to this. They wanted a conquering king, but they didn't want to identify with the suffering servant. And Christ was both king 
and suffering servant. And you can't separate the two. So let me bring it to you right now. We are the same exact way. We don't want any of the bitter experiences of God. We just want the sweet parts of God. Here's what we say. Woo, I'm coming to church. I, I want a healing today. I want the healer. Yeah. I want the way maker. Woo, I need, y- y'all know about Jehovah Jireh, my God's supplier. I need some financial provision right now. That, that's my king, man. That's my God. Whoa, hallelujah. Healer. Opener of blind eyes. Opener of deaf ears. And as soon as something comes along that asks you to suffer a little bit, we don't want that. We want the conquering king. We don't want the suffering servant. And here's, when you re- reduce it all down, here's the bottom line. If that's your mentality, you truly do not know Christ. If that is your mentality, you truly do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not Brandon Ball, Pastor Plowman. That is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, you can't truly know God until you identify with his suffering. See, he never promised us that we'd be delivered from the valley that we're in. But he did promise us that he would walk with us while we go through the valley. So many times we're like, God, get me out of this situation. Get me out of this valley. And God is trying to impart anointing upon our lives. (laughs) So let me ask you again. How many of you want to be anointed of God? I want you to stand to your feet right now. I don't want I don't want you to be looking around. I don't want any distractions right now. I told you that this was a week I felt of consecration. The anointing of God does not get imparted. I'm sorry. I'm, I promise you I'm not trying to offend anybody. I could be wrong. But I don't believe the anointing of God gets imparted by, you know, dancing and shouting. And, and all that's ordained by God. That's good stuff. We need to do that. That's, that's who we are. But following the example of Christ, the anointing comes through consecration and sacrifice. I really believe God is wanting to anoint some of you young men. And I really believe God is wanting to anoint some of you young ladies. And I believe some, even of us back here that are older, God is wanting to either give us a fresh anointing or give us an anointing that we've never had before. But let's be honest. There's got to first be a pressing. I don't know why you're up here, but I I want to turn this front area tonight into a Gethsemane experience. Does that, does that sound weird or does that make sense? A place where we can come that say, you know what? Take this whole world. Here's how another old song. But give me Jesus. Take the cares of this world my financial concerns and cares, my problems, my home problems, my family problems, everything else that's going on, take all of that. But God, just give me a relationship with you. I don't care if you press my schedule. I don't care if you press my free time. I don't care if you press my, what I would consider to be priority. But God, I want to be pressed by the Holy Ghost to the degree that everything inside of me runs out that does not belong. So that He then can begin to pour back into your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm 
I'm wondering if somebody would come to this altar and say, I'm breaking through to my anointing tonight. I'm breaking through to my anointing tonight. For a new anointing. For a fresh anointing. Some young men, some young ladies, God's getting ready to saturate you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Because you've got such a great responsibility set before you that maybe you can't even comprehend right now. Come on, brothers and sisters. We ain't got to be cute about it. I want this to be a Gethsemane moment. Your prayer ought to say, God, press me today. Press my priorities. Press my responsibilities. Press even my free time. Press my family time. Press my finances. Press everything out of me that should not be there. Everything out of me that does not align with your kingdom and your will. Come on, that's it. Feel the weight of the Holy Ghost today. God, God is here. Jesus is here right now. Jesus is walking among you right now. I cannot impart anything to you, but Christ is beginning to impart anointing to some of your lives. You're going to walk different. You're going to talk different. You're going to think different. Come on, that's it, young lady. God, press me. Press me. Come on, that's it, young man. Your generation depends on you. Your friends depend on you. Your family depends on you. Come on, church. The city depends on you. Your lost family depends on you. You need God's anointing. You can't do it with your talent. You can't do it with your ability. You can't. Oh, that's it. Each generation, experience it for yourself. Get a hold of the anointing for yourself. Increasing right now. God, remove me. Remove me from the equation. Get my personality out of the way. Get my identity out of the way. So that more of you can be seen. That's it. Breakthrough. 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 Some of you are at a ceiling right now in the Holy Ghost. Some of you are at a ceiling right now in the spirit dimension. You've got to push through. You've got to break through. Break through. Break through to that anointing today. Break through to that anointing today. Holy Spirit, lead us to the heart of Jesus. There is nothing we want more. We want more. We want more. 
I said, some of you are never going to be the same after tonight. Something's changing here tonight. Something is working tonight. Something is moving tonight. Come on, you ought to begin to feel that impartation feeling in your life right now. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. I decrease as you increase. It's all about you. It's not about me. I decrease as you increase. It's all about not about me it's all about you it's not about me it's all about you it's not about me it's all about you it's not about me from my heart
somebody to minister to right now if you're praying keep praying there's so many folks that are interceding right now i want you to find somebody the gifts of the spirit are operating right now the gift of faith is operating right now tonight faith is elevated so high some of you have already received your impartation now i want you to exercise that go lay hands on somebody in the name of jesus Lord, I pray that people would receive healing in their bodies tonight. God, I pray that pain would leave bodies right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for a financial breakthrough for people tonight. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. 